Thank you. Um, for the perhaps handful of you that I don't know at this point, I'm Arnold Lehman, uh, and I certainly couldn't be more pleased than I am today to be director of the Brooklyn Museum on such a special occasion. Um, I'm truly delighted, as I always am, to welcome you, uh, whether it is for the first time or many, many times, and actually, today is our 12th anniversary of the annual Women in the Arts celebration. So welcome and thank you. And thanks to so many of you who have supported this event and the museum year after year after year. It's very important to us and very special indeed. Uh, today it gives me extraordinary pleasure uh, to honor and celebrate two outstanding women who just happen to be related and who are also my very good friends of many, many years. The visionary art collector, Mira Rubel, and the extraordinary artist, Jennifer Rubel. Over the past decade and more, I am extraordinarily proud of the museum's accomplishments, particularly in engaging a richly diverse audience, becoming central to the singularly active artistic life of our community, and in our focus upon and celebration of feminism and the exceptional creativity of women artists of the past, present, and of the future. Today's important program is yet another indication of the museum's commitment to our mission. And I first want to again thank our honorees and express my gratitude to our great friends and co-chairs of today's event, Mion Lee and Mary Jo Shen. Mary Jo, Mion. I know they're here. Um, and, of course, for the continuing activity of our Council for Feminist Art. I would also like to thank collectively all of the members of our host committee, too numerous to mention individually, but all deserving of our great thanks. Again, thank you for your hard work today, in the past, and for your advocacy, which has made every one of these events such a special occasion and great success. <laughs> For the continuing support of the museum's dedicated trustees, I'd like to extend special gratitude to Elizabeth Sackler, our board chair, to Stephanie Gracia, our president, and to every member of our board for their sustained commitment to the museum. I know many of them are here with us this morning, and I appreciate all that you do. As many of you know, the Women in the Arts Celebration supports the museum's exceptional education activities and the groundbreaking programs of the Elizabeth A. Sackler Center for Feminist Art. Your support, your commitment today, and on many other such occasions, helps the museum to maintain a leadership posture in presenting diverse, dynamic, and engaging exhibitions and public programs to the youngest and most diverse audience of any major museum in this country. Many thanks to all of you who are here today for that passion and that dedication to the work of this museum. One housekeeping note before I introduce Elizabeth, I get to ask all of you to be kind enough to silence all electronic devices, as I know no one wants to miss a word of the program ahead of us. Thank you. And one more special note. Uh, we are excited to extend the opportunity for a private viewing of the exceptional exhibition, Judith Scott, Bound and Unbound, exclusively for you, this afternoon at the Elizabeth A. Sackler Center for Feminist Art, located on the fourth floor of the museum. It's an exhibition that should not be missed. And it is now my great pleasure to introduce our friend, my great friend, our board chair and visionary leader, 
Elizabeth and Sarah. Thank you very much, and good morning, everybody. It's, it's wonderful to have you here. I would like to echo thanks to co-chairs Ian Lee and also Mary Jo Shannon and the host committee for putting together uh, this wonderful morning and lunch. And I am delighted that the Women in the Arts at Brooklyn is honoring Miro Bell and Jennifer. Uh, as Arnold mentioned, your attendance here today is absolutely vital to the continued programming at the Neil Elizabeth Center Center for Feminist Art. We have artists, we have activists, we have uh, programming with authors and scholars and much, much more. And we really uh, strive to create programs for the arts, about the arts, and I like to say beyond the arts. Uh, in addition, of course, the Brooklyn Museum has an extraordinary uh, diverse program of education we serve uh, 400 public schools in this vicinity every year, and we have hundreds of adult and uh, children, young people's uh, programming, and this again helps to support that. Yesterday, I had the pleasure of talking to a woman who is a uh, oral historian, and she was doing a, an article and interviewing me for the volunteer newsletter. And it was really fun uh, speaking with her. And uh, we have right now 200 dedicated volunteers that serve this museum as docents. They serve the museum in education. And they really assist in the entire visitor experience at the Brooklyn. And they help staff in all departments in education and exhibitions. And I'd like to, to thank them especially. Under Arnold's very strong and visionary leadership at the Brooklyn Museum, we have changed. The Brooklyn Museum has changed. Um, in addition to our great collections of art and exhibitions and world culture, we excite the institution in celebrating diversity. We educate and celebrate creativity of all kinds. And I would personally like to thank Arnold for his years of partnership with me over the last 10 years in securing the popularity and supporting the power of the Elizabeth A. Sackler Center for Feminist Start. Without you, it wouldn't have been possible. Arnold, and I thank you deeply. Our Women in the Arts honorees of the past dozen years have included, and many of you have been here, C. Maya Lynn, Annie Lebowitz, Cindy Sherman, Tara Walker, Sharon uh, Nosa, and Yoko Ono. Uh, last year, of course, with Simmons and Lena Dunham. And we thank you, Arnold, for helping put together and make this event at Sack Center is so extraordinary. And so now it gives me a great deal of pleasure uh, to introduce uh, the museum's dedicated shining star. She is a wonderful friend of the museum. She is a friend of ours. She is a friend of mine. And she is the brain and the brawn behind the Brooklyn uh, Artists' Ball. Please welcome Stephanie Rossi, who is our president of the Brooklyn Without knowing a word of English. 
As a young woman, Mira's characteristic thirst for discovery led her to Brooklyn College, where she received a bachelor's in psychology, and later to Long Island University, where she received a master's in education. As a young teacher for Head Start, Mira met a theoretical mathematician, soon to attend med school, who would later become her future husband, Don Ravel. We're happy to have you here, Don. The two quickly discovered that they shared two powerful passions, each other and the love of art. Later, they would go on to build a beautiful family of fellow art lovers and a thriving business of boutique hotels in Baltimore, Miami Beach, and Washington, D.C., not to mention one of the most important private contemporary art collections in the world. As pioneers of young, struggling artists in the 1980s, such as Keith Haring and Jean-Michel Basquiat, the collection has grown over the years to occupy a 45,000 square foot museum quality facility in Miami. The Rubel family collection is known the world over for its groundbreaking contemporary art exhibitions and time and again for its incredible eye for discovering a new generation of art rock stars. This year, Don and Mara celebrated their 50th wedding anniversary, also marking the founding of their collection, and 20 years of influential exhibitions. To commemorate these milestones, a 700-page collection catalog will be published titled Highlights and Artist Writing, featuring, a catalog, uh, featuring 250 artists. Coinciding with the publication, the Rubels have commissioned multiple large-scale artworks and a historical exhibition spanning the breadth of their collection with artists such as Marlene Dumas, Jeff Koons, and Cindy Sherman. I, for one, cannot wait to see what you do with that. The daughter of an exceptional woman and art lover, and nurtured her entire life by art, it is no surprise that Jennifer Rubel has emerged as one of the most respected and original artists working today. Jennifer creates singularly unique and unforgettable participatory artwork, a wild fusion of performance art, installation, sculpture, immersion, and major cultural happenings. Let's just say that Jennifer has made a strong case for food as a medium. <laughs> so much of the art world is defined by its unusual context for social interaction. Jennifer's career was founded on these ideas. Her deconstructed approach to feeding big groups resembles, but also defines, the practice of conceptual art known as rel relational aesthetics, where the artwork creates a social environment in which people participate in a shared activity. Since 2001, Jennifer has organized an annual breakfast at Art Miami Basel. At one such breakfast in 2007, one that I will never forget, uh, Jennifer had laid out large, three large bowls. One had over 2,000 hard-boiled eggs, one had a heaping mound of croissants, one had a heaping mound of bacon, and a box of latex gloves. <laughs> and once people sort of figured out what to do, it was amazing. Um, I'll never forget that. In 2010, Jennifer created a series of out-of-this-world food happenings right here at the Brooklyn Museum for our very first Brooklyn Artist Ball, forever changing the way we think about the gala experience. Picture it, Duchampian urinals dispensing champagne. <laughs> A 20 foot tall pinata made to, in the likeness of Andy Warhol, filled with dessert. 
Not many people can pull that off. Jennifer directed a food performance at the city's hottest ticket, Queen of the Night, a dinner party turned live auction opera from the creator of Sleep No More. And I'm thrilled to announce that at this year's Art Miami Basel, our trustee, Nicole Ehrlich, will be producing a one-night pop-up version of Queen of the Night to benefit the museum. So stay tuned for that. Needless to say, Jennifer creates once-in-a-lifetime experiences out of our wildest dreams and memories that we'll be sharing with our families and friends for years to come. We are in for a real treat this afternoon, or this morning, um, and it is with great pleasure that I welcome our own Sackler family, curator for the Elizabeth A. Sackler Center for Feminist Art, Catherine Morris, and our two honorees, Jennifer and Mira Rubel. Hello. Yeah. Welcome. Thank you all for being here. And thank you for being here. It's wonderful to have this opportunity to talk about the mother-daughter duo again. And to um, we're going to have running in the background as we talk um, a series of slides that document both um, the Bell Collection and also um, Jennifer's projects as well. And I hope you'll excuse us, Jennifer, but I feel like we need to start before you were around, <laughs> <laughs> which means in Brooklyn. Uh, wow. Well, <clears throat> thank you for inviting us. Thank you, Gavin, for interviewing us. Um, and thank you all for coming here. Uh, well, so uh, um, Brooklyn, you know, sometimes the place and the event, you don't know that it's the critical moment and place in your life. As it turns out, Brooklyn turned out to be the critical place in your life. Um, my family arrived in the 50s, and the Brooklyn Museum and the Botanical Brooklyn was literally the place my family hung out in every Sunday. Um, it gives me goosebumps thinking of the, the photographs. My father was a, an avid photo taker of Dwar, and he loved finding this perfect tree in blossom, you know, that in Brooklyn. And of course, walking through this museum was the highlight of every weekend. And, and then Brooklyn, of course, is where, you know, this um, person that I was sitting opposite for three months, never saying a word, thinking that he didn't even notice me. Um, the time he said, asked me to marry him, the first, uh, first word he asked, I mean, the first thing he said to me, would you marry me? <laughs> As it turns out, and the first thing you said was, yes. It's true. It's true. <laughs> Congratulations on 50 years. I, it turns out that we were honing in our, 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 our ability to, to feel, you know, to, to feel things beyond words, you know, like how, to that experience where you actually are learning a lot, but you're not really talking, you know, very unusual today. Uh, and yeah, we have to, we kind of fell in love with not saying a word to each other. And I think it maybe is, um, it, it, it says something about collecting contemporary art. It's often a feeling, an intuition, a suspicion, a possibility. You don't know where it's going to go. So Brooklyn, I mean, who would think that here we are having the thing that I walked with my family in the 50s in the Brooklyn Museum today was sitting on the stage talking to my daughter about how are you with you, Catherine? Thank you. Thank you. It's a lovely, it's a lovely way to start. Um, and did you start looking at art together? Uh, with, or with, with your husband? Or had you started looking before in terms of thinking about an actual possibility of there wasn't, something, there like wasn't something. really a big plan. I mean, he, he, he was always a collector. You know, he's the kid that collected baseball cards. He's the kid that, you know, collected stamps. My family, my family's survival was based on uh, giving up ownership. You know, my father in, in 39, literally, he was on the front against the Germans, um, the Polish soldier against the Germans, and he left his unit to run back to his family to tell them unless they left that night, uh, uh, it looked like Hitler was going to invade Warsaw. So every, so he had nine brothers and sisters. My mother, he was not married to my mother yet. 
And he convinced his nine brothers and sisters, including his parents, including my mother, to um, that night and leave everything behind. And there were those of the family that said, well, we can't leave everything behind. Somebody's going to stay and watch things. So my whole life is about leaving things and certainly not staking. Keeping things and being responsible for things can really um, be dangerous and life-threatening. So the idea that we would become collectors, I mean, somehow, how does this answer the question about how, yeah, we could look at it, but the, the leap into collecting, that, that's a whole other leap, and we could talk about how that happened. It, there was no grand plan, you know, it was really no grand plan, except for the fact that Don was being in the audience, my co-conspirator for 50 years. Um, play tennis with this kid whose parents had made a art collection. And in some weird place in his head, he said, wow, wouldn't it be amazing? But it was like an impossible dream. But I didn't, I wasn't even totally aware of that. So, <laughs> you asked the question about Brooklyn. This is answer. I know, well, you started the game. Um, how did, what were the first things you collected? Well, well, we had this Don, okay, so Don comes down from a corporate meeting where they're telling him, he, he was a theoretical mathematician working for Equitable, and it was a big job to get, and he was at this corporate meeting, uh, executive young training meeting, and they said to him, if you want to be successful, this is the meeting we talk about lifestyle, and we're going to tell you exactly who sh you should marry to continue your forward success. Now this is, I don't know if they still have corporate meetings like this. <laughs> uh, maybe this is the downfall of corporations today. They don't tell you who to marry. But in those days, he came down and he was like, white. I said, what happened? He said, I, I think I have to quit this job. I mean, he took it very seriously. This is who they want me to marry? You don't fit the bill. <laughs> um, so, have you heard this story before? I have not <laughs> <laughs> trying to tell the story to hasn't heard it. Uh, what was the question? <laughs> Art, what are you first, what are you, the first thing oh, yes, so, you bought? So, we have this, so Don decides to go to medical school, and we live in this, you know, fourth floor walk-up apartment with, we get, it's a deal, you know, it's a deal. It's like I'm earning $100 a week as a teacher, we get this apartment, and there are holes in the wall, and the place is a wreck, and we decide, okay, are we gonna pay, this has been the continuing story of uh, collecting, okay? Are we gonna spend the money on painting, plastering, clothes, whatever, or on art? And of course, at that time, we decided, we are gonna go to the Museum of Modern Art, we're going to buy all these posters, and we're going to hang a poster on every hole on that wall. <laughs> so for the price of plastering the painting, we created this incredible collection of posters for the Museum of Modern Art. <laughs> Don't laugh. It's unbelievable. <laughs> we learned about contemporary art. We, I mean, we learned about art. I mean, I didn't really know about Picasso. I didn't know about Matisse. I didn't know about old people. That were, these were big decisions. You know, like spending $20 on a poster and earning $100 a week it was a big deal. So that was our first, you know, it was, it was a big deal. It was a big commitment. And, uh, and then I, it's interesting how we got into my teaching because I was so excited to learn about these artists. And Don knew a little bit more because he grew up, okay, not like me. He grew up with a poster, a starry <laughs> night. <laughs> Do you remember when you sat next to the woman who donated the Sorry Night to the museum? <laughs> and she had, well, any of Lily Bliss. Yes. And he came to me and he says, well, um, anyway. He asked her, this is too good. I'm sorry. I'll tell you, I'm not. He says, this is too good. I have to share this with you. He said to her, who did you grow up with? And he didn't know who he was sitting next to. And he all said, well, I grew up with Starry Night. And she said, that's funny. <laughs> I did not grow up with those. <laughs> no, no. I, I, no. Do you remember what you grew up with? What struck you the most when you were growing up in the collection? Yeah, I mean, for, for me, everybody sort of um, 
distills their childhood into some series of memories that lead them to the end that they arrived at, I think, more or less, right? And so I feel like more than growing up with certain objects, I, I feel like I grew up in a certain world, you know? And so the objects are constantly, um, the objects were really changing because at that time my, my parents didn't have a, a collection open to the public. It was the living room and the dining room and it was never big enough and there was never enough space and they never wanted to pay for storage. And you know, so it was literally like the, the collecting was in a very real time on the walls. Um, it, was a, it, it was that kind of experience. And so I feel like I grew up inside of the dynamic of collecting inside of the dynamic of having artists at the table um, talking, and um, yeah, very much inside of, of, of the contemporary art world. Mm -hmm. So and for me, that's the part of my childhood I really enjoy. The pieces, I mean, there were, you know, I, I, what, I, what I might remember would be uh, Schnabel, and, and uh, Keith Herring's and uh, Francesco Clemente's and um, uh, some of the, the European artists like um, Dockenfield and Don. I'm trying to think what, what was, I mean, there was this very super intense homoerotic painting in the living room. <laughs> my friend's parents would complain to my parents about their kids seeing it, whatever. So that, that struck me strongly. And then on my personal, uh, in my personal room, I removed everything from my room, and I had um, just a bed that I built, white walls, and then these um, Alan McCollum surrogates. That, that, that was all I had in my room. So that, that was kind of, uh, that's what my space was. You built your own bed. Sorry? You built your own bed? I built my own bed. I had Alan McCollum surrogates on the wall, and I would just, I took everything else out of my room, and it was just a carpet, a bed, and Alan McCollum surrogates. Is this a rebellion? Yeah, I think it was like a definitely rebellion within the, the, the predetermined language of uh, the household. The anti-shovel. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> wow. What about, like, uh, what about, your rebellion against how I dressed. Oh. <laughs> um, dress? <laughs> my daughter, I, I put on some uh, some outfit for today, and my daughter rejected, and I changed. So I think my mom took the same approach. <laughs> well, well, yeah, when you, when it, it is, I think it came out okay. <laughs> I, I, to some extent, I feel raised by my daughter, actually. Uh, I, I, I don't know, but I'm sure, you know, as mothers and boys, there's a moment when your daughters really change the way you think about things. And that's how I found. I'm at that point where more and more I feel that way. Mm -hmm. um, Did you feel like she didn't approve of what you dressed? I, I, I she wear the skin type black parachute jumpsuits to parents. He showed me things. A legitimate complaint. <laughs> I just want to say that black was always my color. <laughs> you know, you all have come to black possibly. Being one of the oldest people in the audience uh, in, in the room, I always I don't know what it is about black, um, but. Um, Look, I, as having immigrant parents, I always thought you were embarrassed. Of, it, it was more than to be embarrassed of immigrant parents. You know, they didn't speak English, or they had accents, or they were uneducated. Uh, I was, I, I was proud of my parents. I loved them, but I was also kind of, you know, I knew their place. Like, I don't know whether Dawn didn't want to meet my parents on the first day, or I kind of influenced that. But he had, they actually didn't get to meet him for a while. So my point is, I always thought that kids were embarrassed of their immigrant parents. I didn't realize that kids are embarrassed of their parents, period. <laughs> <laughs> so it came to me as a big shocker to 
know that here I am, Ameri the Americanized, educated person, right? And my kids are American. So, because there was a lot of going back 30 years ago, <laughs> we, really, we really got to know her at this point. Well, <laughs> back to growing up around art and young art, because it's not just the art on the wall for us, it was a way of life. But also, art, the art world then was not what it is now. It was not like every hedge fund guy at your child's school collects art. And the art world was, was not a mainstream world. It was actually a world where people were doing what they did. Um, well, they smoked a lot. They did smoke a lot then. They smoked a lot, yeah. After every opening, they had hundreds. I mean, sometimes the house was like full of cigarettes. Yeah, but they, but it wasn't the, the the idea of the art world as a legitimate world was not I, it, it was only legitimate to people in the art world at that time. Yeah, well, so the, they, story, yeah. Uh, the way that you guys as a group collected or mm -hmm. collect is that after that you sort of vote, you decide as a group when when a decision gets made. You tell them about that story. Well, Jennifer was always. Uh, Jennifer, like, would well, you can speak for the others, and then I'll, I'll, I'll give you my I'll give uh, my perception of you. Jennifer, when she was nine years old, she turned vegetarian. No, 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 Jake, okay, Don was the collector, and the gene, the collecting gene, that's what, because there is a kind of collector. I don't have that collecting gene, even though I have taken, I have jumped into that massive, deep pool called collecting, out of, uh, I mean, in a way, out of necessity. You know, I don't know, I, I don't think he'd be married today if he didn't. I mean, I'm looking at you. He <laughs> doesn't know, Mike's just got wild. Like Don, he always had a collecting sheet. Meaning, there's this pleasure in the in the search, in the uh, in, in, in the discovery, in the in the, the ultimate uh, 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 pleasure in acquiring. It, 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 there's a gene there. Don had a gene, and I leaped into it in a way. As it turns out. It became a way for me to understand my life and my condition being kind of, you know, as an immigrant, you're always, you, it's like you're never comfortable. It's like you're always somehow, you don't know where home is. How did you work? You, you just don't know. So art was, a, it became for me a way of learning about myself and how being different and being unique was celebrated. Now, Jennifer, for Jennifer, being unique was her way of life. It was who she was. Was she announced she was going to be a vegetarian at age nine? Maybe not. Maybe <laughs> not. Okay, so Jennifer, <laughs> Jennifer has always had a very strong mind. Not to mention a very active mind. Very hard, you know, as parents, you know, that's not easy. You know, kids, they just do as they you tell them. <laughs> Us to to start 
collecting their work. We didn't call it collecting, we just happened to have an original work of art next to our collection of posters. And so that's, yeah. but then once you have the children in the family. Well, the Jason, so the idea was that since we, since so many resources were going towards that end, Don and I, it was, okay, we'll collect this. We're not going to like, he's not going to spend money on his own, and I'm not going to spend money. It's not like your passion, my passion. We're going to do it, we're going to do it together. And we made a deal. It was like written in blood, although violated by my husband sometimes, which, 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 it was only once. Uh, <laughs> talks like I'm talking about a mistress, but it looks like having a mistress, really. Uh, that if we were going to collect, there had to be consensus. And that, and that consensus was not easy to agree. It was not easy. But building the consensus was the way we learned how to collect together. And when the kids were born, Jason was very natural. But very, very soon, as soon as he had an opinion, we valued his opinion. And very soon after that, he participated in the selection of the work and became a consensus. We basically, to this day, do not buy unless we agree. Now, Jennifer, took a, a left turn, you know. She went, for her, it was just a question of time whether when she was going to commit herself and identify as a person That took a huge leap. That, that was a whole other, because you don't, you don't know too many artists that are collectors. Children, children of collectors do not become artists. That's a whole other conversation that can happen. Let me take you back. I would imagine that would be a difficult to make, living with what you live with, and then making the decision to become honest. Well, yeah, I mean, I think, I, you know, if I uh, considered me just in the lightest way, not knowing any, I would dismiss me too, you know? Like, it's amazing how strong an inclination it is to dismiss uh, the children of anyone, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and. It, I, I, I don't really know where that comes from because if you're the child of an art collector, the bar is so high that if you just make bad art, you probably won't do it because it'll kill you to to not get close to that bar. You know, like if you feel like that bar is out of reach, you you just won't try to grab it uh, unless you're you're uh, totally clueless. You know, um, so. Yeah, that it, it was an incredibly it, it was an incredibly difficult thing to do, and then of course, like um, well, like let's say slavery or being a woman or any of these things, it, it's very easy to internalize that message. So it's very easy to internalize the message of being worthless or of being uh, um, a dilettante or or whatever it is. And then particularly the type of work that I've always been interested in, which is this kind of, um, it doesn't fit neatly inside of the definition of art, um, is, is already a kind of marginalizing experience. So, yeah, I can't say that, that it was easy. I can say that I'm very happy that it wasn't easy uh, because uh, the level of commitment that's required to to constantly ask of yourself something that you are not entirely sure you can actually create is um, you know, having that kind of negative message um, as practice for that, I think is quite a luxury. You know? So uh, yeah, that's, that, that, that's sort of how, how I arrived. But I don't, my work is so much about where I come from, also, it's so much. It, it's so much about having been deeply on the inside that I can't even. I can't even imagine that there are no other conditions that would give rise to the work that I do. So, so it's a kind of perfect. And you know, I mean, I should say just so it's clear, I absolutely love growing up with my family. You know, I mean, it's aside from the art, there's just uh, there's a lot of art and there's a lot of love. There's almost. There's almost and tennis, but, but that's also. Awesome. <laughs> but um, there's a lot of love, art, a lot of love. Uh, there's the tennis for those who are interested, and then there's not much else. So, but that's uh, that's kind of lovely too. Wait, wait. What about all the cooking? Yeah, and cooking for some, yeah, including me, my mother.
it was fantastic. Good. No, no but we spent a lot of time in the kitchen. We actually did. And what was the first project you did with this sort of social practice? Or the, your, well, I can't say that was the first project because I kind of, uh, I, because be, I'm so self-conscious about being an artist, I, I essentially made art in situations and conditions where uh, it was clearly art, but I might have been the only one who knew it. You know, so I, I worked inside of a self artist. I was a self artist. I was like a, a yeah. So I worked with my family inside the hotel business, for instance, and. I would leave these anonymous love letters on um, guest pillows. <laughs> so yeah, it, to me it was art. To the like modeling companies who had contracts with the hotel, it was stalking. But you know, so but that yeah. So it, it, I, I can't, there, there there was no uh, there was no first project. You know. Yeah. And when did when did you start thinking about the food? Uh, well, I was always really involved with food. Um, I mean, I always, I always cooked, and I always, and then, you know, I started writing about food um, shortly after college, um, and 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 then the food world to me kind of, I thought there was the possibility of doing what it was I needed to do in the world inside the food world and avoid the art context altogether. Mm -hmm. Except when I tried that. Uh, the, I mean, it's, it's a clear memory that I, I had this audition at the Food Network, and I really did everything I could to pass as a normal person. So like, I, you know, I studied, like I studied all the people on TV, and realized that all of them wear short sleeve V-neck bright colored T-shirts, tight, and so I wore that, you know. And then I, um, they said, you know, talk about how your grandmother gave you this recipe and where you were at the time. It's like, it was so far from my experience that, um, you know, I talked about some fictional trip to the south of France with my grandmother <laughs> and my mother on some, and, um, and then, so I really thought that I was passing as a very um, mainstream kind of cooking person. And then they called me in like a month later and they said, yeah, you know, you cook really well and you're on TV, but um, we just feel like you're a little alternative for us. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, it, but it was interesting because that meeting, of course, rejection is, is like absolutely fueling for me at least, but that meeting uh, was really, I walked out of that meeting and I, I, was, I, I was completely fed up with myself because I felt like my need to avoid being uh, defined as an artist and to avoid the, the, the scrutiny that, that would come with that uh, was, was making it impossible for me to do what I had to do in the world. And so I walked out of there and it was like, okay, that's, that, that's it. There's no, there's, no, there's no road there that will lead me to where I want to go. You know, but it's interesting. Um, watching Jennifer, like allowing herself to be born as an artist has taught us so much about um, really understanding art. As, as for the all the years that we did, uh, with our contact with artists was so intimate from the days that we met them in the studios, you know, in the retail shops, uh, on, on, in the flower district. Watching Jennifer and uh, being, you know, being intimate and inside that, what her becoming an artist has taught us so much about what it, the courage that it takes to become an artist. I, I mean, we've always respected and understood how, well, how powerful it is for someone to put themselves out there and make the work, the powerful work out there is total vulnerability. I mean, it always is about being vulnerable. But watching the birth of an artist who, who happened to be our daughter so close up uh, gave us uh, the, the, the big push to really I think we now enter a studio with a, a more clear understanding. In the same way that, um, well, that, that it, it's, it's going to be I was just going to say that, you know, our son who actually, with the collective gene at some point, opened the gallery, and that gave us an insight view into what it means to be a gallery. And that was very valuable to our collective. The way you describe your, 
entry into collecting sounds very intimate and very personal and very exploratory. So how was it difficult to, to come to the point where you wanted to make a transition into this public space that has become such a huge part of the community in Miami and, Miami and is, is so instrumental in the world? Well, that's becoming public is a whole other story because um, we couldn't collect the work that we collect, keeping it, you know, in our, in our non-private space. Mm -hmm. um, and plus, uh, it, interacting with the public in the way that, that our collection does it is uh, profoundly uh, uh, altering to, to the way we think about ourselves. Uh, all the kids, I mean, we have thousands of kids that visit the collection every year. The impact that art has on people and, and just and kids in particular, understanding that there are alternatives and choices in life and being unique is not is not something to be embarrassed about. But it is a it's a gift. That, that art endlessly makes that point. And uh, watching our two children go in these two different directions gave us I think a tremendous in deeper, deeper, deeper inside. For example, just the other day, uh, to Jennifer, you are like such a shy person. Like one old thing about Jennifer, you wouldn't know now. Like Don was there. I mean, you know, he was shy because he didn't say a word to me except to, to propose the first thing that was said to rehearse, say, would you marry me? It took him three months to rehearse that. But so I knew growing up as a shy person, but I, I came to understand that Jennifer was very shy. And um, and she's doing work now that just shocks me how wow shy person makes work like this. So can can you address that? And what do you what do you, what do you like? Uh, well, what you said about shyness the other day just blew me away because finally I understood here I'm married to a man for 50 years, and what she said about herself being shy gave me an insight into my husband's shyness, which I didn't quite really understand. I never really thought about it that way. And then we have about five grandchildren. One is really, really shy, got the shy gene. And so now I said, wow, this really gives me an insight into my grandchild's shyness, which if you know a shy person, it's like, it's like something you don't really, like, you know, I, I've never, you know, what did you say? <laughs> <laughs> well, that was not going to sound that exciting, but with that build up. But, uh, you know, I was talking about how being shy is a lot about having, uh, being very, very attuned to other people and, um, and being so um, sensitive to what they're feeling and what they might be thinking or feeling in relation to you. Um, that you, you, you kind of can't, is that what I said? That you, you can't really engage That's exactly what you said. It's, and, um, I did read this book called Goodbye to Shy. <laughs> <laughs> and it totally changed my life. That's, uh, that's, uh, and yet your projects are all about being in the social. Yeah, my, project, well, my, my projects all create a context for people to engage with not just the work, but also each other. Um, it, it, it gives them a way of being there that isn't going to kill them if they're shot. It, it's actually a means to social interaction, uh, no matter how you, how, how you feel about yourself. It, they almost kind of take you out of yourself because you become a kind of protagonist inside the projects and not, not a, 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 a receiver. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, you know, the, big, the amazing thing, I mean, I'm sure there's some characters here if you can look at your heart. It's just amazing that there's always something that's being shared in a way that just blows you away in terms of like, it informs you in a way that you never thought of before. I mean, there's something about this visual experience and what artists give us that just blows us away. I mean, it suddenly makes us live our life in a, in a different, I, mean, I just don't, I can't even imagine the life I would live if it wasn't for what I uh, did day in and day out. I mean, I was practicing medicine for 30 years, 
But you know, at, at, but, um, and we had the two kids, but we still managed to see, I don't know, 30 studios a week, you know. Wow. It was like the activity, it was like the out of life. I mean, and did you have this natural intoxicating? And, um, but I'm just, but being so close to, but this is different, this is so intimate now. Mm -hmm. It's so intimate, uh, seeing it, like so up close. Yeah, I mean, I think I was, the, the, um, the catalog for the, the this exhibition celebrating the 20 years of the collection, 50 years of my parents being married. In the catalog, uh, all of the artists were asked to submit. Not, not all. Not all. I'm sorry. Some of the some of the artists. Do you want you talk about it? No, no, no. no, 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 no because it was it was really our director's idea. He said, "This is uh, this is a, 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 a an important thing and a anniversary. Some of these artists have been in the collection 30, 40 years." Why don't we ask them if they would say something about the work that you collected? And Don and I thought, this is ridiculous. They, they're not even going to remember. You know, like, you went on a date with, with uh, I don't know, um, um, you know, some movie star, you know, who became a movie star. Are they going to remember you? George Clooney, if you had a date with him. Is he going to remember that you in high school had, like, you know, you went to the prom? I mean, maybe he, he wouldn't remember. So he said, no, we got to ask these people. Let's ask the artists to share with, uh, uh, if, would they share one sentence, two sentences, whatever they want, to share the first piece that we collected of theirs. Okay, so then let me, let me just say, because I know you probably won't want to, yeah. So, uh, for instance, uh, all this to say that I think that the level at which my parents collect, it means so much to the artists that it's, it's something that's like, it's beyond, it has nothing to do with the transaction of like money for art, you know, it, because it's about this kind of validation at a moment that, because the moment before you're validated is usually the moment where you just can't take it anymore. You know, like it's, it's like that, it, one naturally follows on the other. And so like, for instance, Richard, I, I, I've been reading a bunch of them as they've been coming in, like Richard Prince wrote how he went, because my parents used to have this party after the opening of the Whitney Biennial every year, and it was this kind of legendary party. And I think it was so legendary because my parents are the least excluding, exclusive people on the planet. So they let anybody in, and the house was packed, and artists would bring their friends or tell their friends or whatever. And so Richard wrote about uh, how he came to this party, and they had just been to the studio and bought this piece from him. And he went to the party, he didn't know a person there, and it was literally the first time he ever saw a piece of his hanging anywhere other than the studio. I mean, it's unbelievable, you know? Yeah, great. It's truly unbelievable. And so that experience, I mean, that, you know, that, it, that experience with art, I mean, I feel like that's my reference side. More than, you know, like today, there's kind of, it's, it's like, um, they still have those experiences all the time, but it's like there's an idea that there's a museum and there's collectors and whatever. But the, that constant belief in in young artists who were doing what they what they were doing was was like the metronome of my childhood. Well, Jeff Kulia, I have to share with you with Jeff Kulia. So another experience that we have with Jeff Koons was uh, we had these pretty spontaneous parties. It wasn't like we never sent out a. a uh, an invitation, which we kind of still don't do. The truth of the matter, anytime you're ever having a party, chances are you can come. You can come. <laughs> you can come. You're, you're officially invited. Because we don't even now. I mean, but anyway, so uh, the, so one day, uh, the day after, the morning, the, the, the night after the, this one of the Whitney Biennial parties, I think it was in 1979. Uh, the doorbell rings. We lived in this tent house close to the Whitney, which made it very convenient after the Whitney party to just walk over. So the doorbell rings, and we, we said, Well, who is it? So this is Jeff. Well, Jeff who? Jeff Holmes. So I said, oh, um, Yes, uh, can we help you? He says, Well, I'm here for the Whitney party. We said, Well, uh, wait a minute. So Don and I went downstairs. Open the door and said, because you knew this is an artist coming for the Whitney party. A day late, he'd be very disappointed. So he, <laughs> sure enough, we came downstairs and he was, and he said, I'm here for, I said, if, if there was a party, 
you know, the door would be open and hundreds of people would be coming in. I'm sorry, you really missed the place. Are you sure I missed the place? Yeah, yeah, but really, really, really missed the party. He was so disappointed, he was so heartbroken. He said, oh, well, we were practically in our pajamas. We weren't, we were so hungover from the night before. But we invited him in the house and uh, we said, well, we're just about to sit down and have pasta. I can make pasta in 20 minutes. So we ended up having pasta together. And the next day, he sent us this beautiful a piece, which you can see at the Whitney. It's, a, it's one of the first inflatable, individual inflated flowers. That's the piece that he sent to us as a thank you for dinner the, night, the following morning. So we've been telling the story and thinking of the story for years and years and years, since 79, right? And I thought, well, what did it really happen that way? What did it really like that? So when our director sent out this request, would you write something you know, for the first piece that uh, you know, uh, the Rebels collected. Uh, he wrote, he repeated the story. And I thought, wow, we had a date. And we actually remembered. <laughs> it really and in some way, I became, you know, we became pregnant, you know, because we really owned this amazing piece. So there you go. Well, one of the reasons I think people remember you, obviously, is, is the way that you do collect. And you have have this long tradition of collecting debt and really committing to people. And that's, is that something that just came naturally? I mean, even your story about going to the same studios with five dollars for five people over the course of time, it seems like a natural inclination to sort of go well, in deep. Well, now when we collect, it's really, we're always thinking about, like, the story we're going to tell. I mean, like, we're going to do, we try to do rules of artists when we do, for those of you who have come to see our um, collection. We try to tell a, a, a story, so it, it, it's easier to tell the story with more than one piece. Although many years we thought, oh, we have a piece, so that's it. Now, we think in terms of stories, and artists work changes and progress. Um, uh, so, and also in the case, and in, in now, like for the story of the universal thing that we, we decided to really do something like wild, which is we, we never really commissioned artwork, per mm -hmm. se. I mean, we flirted a little bit with it, but it always felt like we want to know the piece, we want to know, we don't want to take the we want to know that this is the piece. But we've come to understand that if you believe in the artist, sometimes it's kind of interesting to say, you know, knock yourself out and, you know, is there some inspiration that you have in the space? So this year, we actually commissioned six artists who are, who we said, look, you can wake us up when it's over or you can keep us engaged in this process. And uh, just yesterday, we've been to this one school in New York, and I guess it's the fourth visit. Uh, he, wants, he wants us to be involved, and, and we're going to be, and tomorrow I'm going to a studio all the way out in Kingston, New York, because that always chooses us to be engaged in the process. And it's, it's so exciting. It's so exciting. And the one artist that we gave, six, uh, one artist, I mean, we flirted with this, this is something fresh and new to us. Uh, two years ago, we gave this young artist from, from uh, London that we met, Oscar Morillo, who said, you know, we're, we're gonna be away for six weeks, take over our house, which is right next, back, you know, we live right next door to the collection. Just live there and use one of the galleries as a studio. At first, the staff thought, oh my God, this is gonna really disturb, you know, we, we have so much work to do during the summer, you know, the installing, Catalog, and we had so much to do. Why bring an artist into it? Well, it was extraordinary, you know, to have an artist living and working in the space, and it turned out to be so, so vital, so risky, so engaging. For one thing, he's a great cook. He would make sausage for them every day, uh, Colombian sausage, you know, the deadly kind. So, uh, so we're. we're we don't know what's going to come off. The, the, all the galleries on the ground floor uh, will be all com commissioned work um, of young artists who we've never shown before. And this will be opening like in during our fair. Yes. So, so when do you start installation? Well, they're still making it. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 and if that isn't nerve wracking enough, in addition to the 700 page catalog, this, this, I'm talking about these crazy people. Like, I don't feel like I'm talking about myself. <laughs> In addition to the 700 page catalog, um, we invited these artists to knock themselves out of the catalog. So, so far, so, so two, a, a week ago, 
one of the artists said, you know, you said I should do a catalog. It looks like it's going to be around 400 pages. <laughs> and uh, do you think you could be ready for Art Basel? And we said, yeah. I don't know how, but it's going to happen. It is going to happen. Because what we came to understand, and it's something that we'll have to pay attention in the future, is when you actually get going in, inside of a creative process, you just, you, 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 you're not allowed to say no. You do that. And that's something that this museum knows a lot about. <laughs> you don't say no to others. You do whatever you have to do. Because otherwise you wouldn't get the work that you get here and the projects that you have going on here. It's, it's that kind of museum, and that's what artists talk about. Brooklyn Museum um, makes things happen. So hopefully we can deliver to the artists what you guys do all the time. Well, thank you very much. It's a wonderful place to end. Except that I feel like we should all wish you a very happy 50th anniversary. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you very much for such great conversation. I now get to present you both with your awards. Come on up. Thank you, Paul.